Great, okay. Um, I think we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for joining today. My name is Julian kraus -Holt. I'm a consultant for Friends of the Earth Food and Agriculture Program, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Uh, on behalf of Friends of the Earth and the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, I welcome everyone to today's webinar, Scaling Up Healthy, Climate-Friendly School Food. With increasing public attention, this is an exciting time for public school food. Communities have begun to acknowledge the profound impact of school food and its implications for public health and the environment. Our recent report and this webinar spotlights this growing trend and relays best practices for serving more healthy and environmentally sound meals in schools nationwide. In this webinar, you will learn about what defines climate-friendly school food, how schools are implementing menu changes, and what policy actions can be taken to support this movement. Here's a list of our three uh, learning objectives. Um, please note that throughout the webinar, uh, you can submit a question at any time uh, in the Q&A box on the right side of your screen, and we will address it at the end. If your question is not uh, covered today, we will happily reply to questions via email afterwards. Um, each of these objectives will be covered by a different speaker. And to introduce today's speakers, uh, we have Jen Dalton, who leads Kitchen Table Consulting as a consultant with Friends of the Earth Climate Friendly School Food Program. Chef Ann Cooper, uh, who's a celebrated author, chef, educator, and enduring advocate for better food for all children, and is currently the Nutrition Services Director at Boulder Valley School District in Colorado. And then finally, Maggie Niola uh, is a dietitian at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and advocates for eating plant-based foods for optimal health and disease prevention. Ms. Neola is passionate about helping schools, medical centers, community members, and policymakers implement health healthful changes for the long run. Now, without further ado, we will begin with Jen Dalton discussing the first objective, defining healthy, climate-friendly school food. Sorry for the delay there, everybody. I just got a brand new phone and couldn't figure out how to uh, make it come back on. So I appreciate your patience. I want to thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy day to join us today um, and giving me the opportunity to share information um, with you from both our um, report that I co-authored with Julian, our moderator, and our colleague Kari Hammerschlag at Friends of the Earth. Uh, entitled Scaling Up Healthy Climate-Friendly School Food, but also share some of um, the environmental impacts of non-climate-friendly school food and, uh, you know, give you some more information about, um, you know, exactly what climate-friendly school food is, again, how it is distinguished from non-climate-friendly food, why it's important right now, the difference that even small recipe swaps can make, and some broader strategies that we learned about in the report that we co-authored. So why specifically are we talking about school food service and climate change? And what are climate-friendly foods? Uh, this past year, as I'm sure you all know, has been a stark reminder of why we need to focus more of our attention on addressing climate change. I'm sure you've all been hearing the news reports about the devastating impacts of the extreme fires in California right now. And, you know, I live in Northern California where our community has had at least three fires in the last year. Um, and the drought across the Midwest has been another indicator, as well as Hurricane Florence in the Carolinas that claimed the lives of more than 40 people and killed 4 million farm animals, mostly chicken and turkeys. Um, as you hear about the role of global warming in making these devastating weather events more extreme, what you're probably not hearing about is the role of food and animal foods in particular, especially meat and cheese uh, in generating the greenhouse gas emissions that are causing a lot of the havoc. And since schools serve more than 7 billion meals a year, there is a huge opportunity right now to reduce the climate impact of those meals in particular and serve healthier food at the same time. So climate-friendly food, what is it? This is how Friends of the Earth defines it. Um, 
it's, it's a multi-benefit strategy that principally achieves a lower carbon and water footprint than traditional food service by offering a wider array of healthy plant-forward and plant-based foods and reducing food waste. It also cuts emissions by sourcing from regenerative farms that use carbon-enhancing, healthy soil practices, and implementing other energy and water-saving measures. The shift to climate-friendly food is inclusive of and totally complementary to farm to school initiatives that have been, you know, in in in, um, uh, in schools for the last, you know, several decades, and that prioritize fresh, organic, and responsibly sourced ingredients from local farms, and also educate students about the power of food to cultivate healthy people and healthy minds. So, food service directors. As I'm sure many of you know, face complex demands and requirements every single day. And as friends of the earth, we truly believe that serving kids tasty and nutritious food is and must always remain their number one priority. And we know that the good people who are working as food service directors make this their priority every single day. And luckily, the good news and what is so exciting about our findings from the numerous case studies that we've conducted and the information that we've learned uh, in our most recent report from 18 school districts across the country is that there doesn't have to be a choice between healthy food and a lower environmental impact. Our case studies have shown that schools can both improve the quality of school food by serving healthier and delicious meals that kids love and reduce the carbon and water footprint of the food and either save money or at the very least not cost, like, um, use any extra money and being cost neutral. And we're not alone in recommending this recommend reduction in meat and cheese consumption. As you can see, there's an overwhelming public health consensus that recommends a diet that reduces red meat in particular, and especially processed meat, and also advocates our plant-based meals. These public health recommendations must translate to the school food environment, not only in order to serve healthier foods that help school children reduce their risks of chronic diseases and the propensity towards obesity, and of course, you know, can help instill healthy habits, but it also plays a huge role in helping the planet. As you can see in this graph, food and agriculture globally is responsible for at least 24% of greenhouse gas emissions. And more than half of those emissions, 14%, are caused by food animal production alone, more than the emissions generated by the entire transportation sector. And where are these emissions coming from? Well, the majority of it comes from livestock, as you can see in the photo, primarily beef and dairy cows that release methane gas. And they do that by burping and farting, but mostly through burping, as they digest their food. This methane is 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Another reason that beef cows contribute so many emissions has to do with the fact that they're very inefficient at converting feed into meat. And estimates range from 6 to 10 pounds of feed per pound of meat. And producing all that feed has major impacts, which we actually don't have time to go into today, but is also a very uh, interesting part of the story. But this next wonky graph <laughs> shows you that is if the current ag production and meat consumption trends continue in their current trajectory, the emissions from food and agriculture will cause climate change to nearly surpass the 2 degrees Celsius target above pre-industrial levels that was set in Paris. In other words, if every single other sector, including energy production, industry, and transportation, cut their emissions to zero, Today, if we don't reduce meat consumption and production and food waste, we cannot stop the most catastrophic impact of climate change. And here in the U.S., we have a special responsibility since we are one of the highest meat per capita consuming countries in the world. Americans eat nearly three times that of the rest of the world. So what does this data say that about the specific carbon footprint of the food that we eat and serve in food establishments? As you can see in this slide, hugely varying carbon footprints depend on the type of food protein. In this slide, the yellow and green bars show the climate-friendly foods that have a lower carbon footprint. Those are the beans, lentils, tofu, rice, broccoli, potatoes. 
And the red lines show the super resource and carbon intensive foods. You can see it's beef, cheese, pork. And to lesser extent, chicken, which is good to know. In fact, beef has five times greater the emissions than pork, seven times greater the emissions than chicken, and 13 to 15 times greater emissions than vegetable proteins like lentils and tofu, and nearly 30 times as carbon intensive as garbanzos and other beans, which incidentally are also superfoods. And as you can see here, the water footprint of animal products is also much larger than plant-based alternatives, with the exception of almonds. And the data shows that we will eventually run out of water. And if the world doesn't reduce its consumption of industrial animal products, this is really an integral or an intergenerational equity issue and could jeopardize future food security for all of us. So I think we need to ask ourselves, what kind of world are we leaving for our kids? The Culinary Institute of America and the Harvard Chan School of Public, School of Public Health have come together um, with a wonderful initiative called Menus of Change. I'm sure many of you have heard about it. If you haven't, I would highly recommend that you look into it. But what they've said is um, greater emphasis on plant-based foods, including plant-based proteins, is the single most important contribution that the food service industry can make toward environmental sustainability. So as a part of the food service industry, school food service professionals have an extraordinary opportunity right now to be leaders for positive change. And I would add to that, so does anyone who is a school food stakeholder. You have an opportunity to use your voice right now to advocate for changes that are going to leave the world in a better place for generations to come. So in the context of school food, uh, continuing on, um, Friends of the Earth did a comprehensive carbon footprint analysis of Oakland Unified School District shifts and purchases over a two-year period. And over that time, Oakland reshaped its menu and it reduced its animal food purchases by nearly 30%. This is mostly in the realms of purchasing chicken and cheese, while they also increased their purchases in use of legumes and fruits and vegetables. This shift saved 42 million gall gallons of water over just two years, reduced their carbon footprint by 14%, and this 14% is equivalent to 15,000 trees being planted or the energy saved by installing 87 solar panel systems on Oakland school roofs. And incidentally, they also saved $42,000. They were able at the same time to increase um, their purchases of better organic and pasture-raised meat from dairy cows uh, that's far better for people on the planet than the beef that they previously purchased from feedlots, which you saw in the photograph um, in the prior slide. So with nearly 7 billion meals served by schools, School Food Service has the potential to be a powerful climate mitigation strategy while also serving healthier plant-based foods that are encouraged for both health and the environment. And we ran some numbers, um, and we found that, oh, I'm sorry, if every public school swapped out a beef burger for a veggie burger just once a month, we would save 1.4 billion pounds of CO2, which is equivalent to not burning 72 million gallons of gas or 700 million pounds of coal. And that's just one recipe swap 10 times a year. So this next example is just of another one recipe swap. It was over a two-year period in Lee County School District in Florida. Um, and it shows the difference that they made by just replacing the beef in their um, beef tomato pasta with a soy crumble from the company called Beyond Meat. It had the same environmental impact as not burning, um, you know, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 120,000 gallon ga gallons of gas or not driving 2.6 million miles or the equivalent of planting 30,000 trees and letting them grow for 10 years. So you can see that just over the course of a short period of time, just making one recipe swap can have a huge environmental difference. So, We've mentioned before that um, this September, Julian Krauss-Polk, myself, and my colleague, Kari Hammerschlag, released a report for Friends of the Earth that looked at national trends in plant-based school food. We interviewed over 35,000, sorry, 35,000, 35 school food service professionals 
of which 18 um, are food service and nutrition service directors from districts that are both urban, suburban, and rural, large, medium, and small. And we conducted four, four case studies, one of which being um, with Lee County in Florida that you just saw an example from. You're going to hear from Chef Ann Cooper in Boulder, who represents another. And we also conducted case studies um, from Nevada Unified and Santa Barbara, both in California. And from those interviews with all of these school food stakeholders, we identified a number of common key strategies for scaling up implementation of healthy, climate-friendly school food. And I'm going to go into each of these in a little bit more depth. So boosting student participation in the image of school food, in general, bar none, was one of the biggest um, opportunities or strategies that our in 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 interviewees mentioned. Part of that is because, um, you know, A, funding for school meals is tied to participation numbers. And so it's obviously super important to get more kids to be eating more school food in order to get money so that schools can serve better food um, and get healthy food to more students. Um, and also this idea that a lot of the stigma around eating school food is still present. I'm sure a lot of the parents of the students who are in school right now um, came from an environment where they saw school food as being like icky or like why would you eat it or it's just not something that you do or there's a stigma against, um, you know, socializing in the school cafeteria environment or, or what have you, but there are ideas around school food that linger on. And so there's an opportunity right now to tell a new story. Um, and many of the inspiring leaders that we interviewed have been talking about have how they've shifted or are shifting for these entrenched fast food models that are um, a part of the school food environment in many areas um, towards more of a hospitality mindset that is not only about changing the food environment um, by doing things like making the food lines into like a food court environment and um, making like buildable stations for students and providing grab and go options, things that students see outside of the school environment, like in retail um, locations, um, like protein packs and things like that. And also doing um, pop-up concepts and providing cool things like food trucks. So the photo that you see is from a food truck um, in Austin, Texas. I just can see it. It's got their logo right there. And, you know, the whole idea is to make it hip and cool and different. Uh, another interviewee um, from um, Kristen Hellman from Riverside Unified in California mentioned that she got kids really excited about having uh, vegan food at her school uh, by doing pop-up vegan restaurants, where she'd essentially bring samples of vegan food uh, to each school site and just kind of say that it was a pop-up restaurant that was happening and kids could come and try the food for free. Um, these and, you know, using fresh and local ingredients and increasing scratch and seed scratch cooking in general have been shown to increase uh, participation uh, with eating school food. So another thing about boosting participation and the image of school food is that there's been a shift towards um, creating cultural preference for plant-based food as opposed to what has traditionally been seen as like kid food. Uh, like pepperoni pizzas and chicken nuggets and the sort of McDonaldized version of what um, kid food is supposed to look like or the, uh, the marketing or corporate vision of what that is. Um, and also kind of helping both parents and students get an idea of how plant-based nutrition and protein nutrition in particular can have the same um, benefits as animal um, protein nutrition. Uh, so there's a, a great um, misunderstanding about um, the benefits of plant-based proteins. So a lot of the leaders that we interviewed are creating strategies aimed at shifting preferences towards plant-based. And one of the most impactful ways to do that is to taste test. So schools are doing all sorts of different things like try it days or um, a really popular recipe contest where students get an opportunity to propose recipe ideas to the food service directors and their staff, and then the best recipes um, that are voted on by the students get to be a part of the school food menu. Um, that was done in um, San Diego to a great effect. There's something they call Ava's Avocado Salad. Can you imagine? She even has her name on it. So. 
um, that's really cool. Um, students really enjoy that, knowing that they've had, been a part of the process. And in San Francisco, for example, they do student focus groups. They have something that they call a, um, it's a school food leadership council, where they get students together to not only taste food and offer um, focus group-like comments and, and feedback on flavor, but also advise um, staff and decision makers about you know what they see is important in terms of like environmental sustainability and um, you know their their food preferences and things like that. And they've shown that that is helping to increase um, participation. But we also learned that you you, can't, you should only really talk about the food flavor. The positive messaging is absolutely important. So you could call things yummy or crunchy, um, and or even just describe what it is. It's, it's carrot ginger soup, for example. But you never use words like vegan, vegetarian, meatless, et cetera. As Tara McNamara, the marketing coordinator for San Diego Unified, who is a, a powerhouse, uh, said to us, is like, calling it vegetarian, it makes it sound like it's just for vegetarians. But the idea is that it's for everybody, right? Um, you know, Meatless Mondays, by the way, too, have been pretty effective use of helping to do messaging and um, provide opportunities for tasting. And, and then a lot of folks have um, renamed them Lean and Green Days, and that's been kind of effective as an implementation strategy. And also, we found that teachers and administrators um, really need to kind of get in the game and act as models for enjoying school food. And we know that it's hard for teachers um, and administrators to give up their, their own break to hang out with the kids in the lunchroom. But if they could sit with the students every once in a while and also eat the school food and show that they really enjoy it, then it can make a huge difference um, with participation and just that nutrition education piece and talking with kids about the food. And speaking of nutrition education, obviously, you know, it, none of this will be effective without, um, you know, concurrent nutrition education. And here uh, is a poster from an inspiring program called Lean and Green Kids, and they provide materials and curriculum for celebrating the bean in its many forms and tie it into history and cultural lesson plans. Um, we've also um, investigated the whole idea around how do you create effective operations for implementation of, of, of more healthy, climate-friendly school food. And we found that, um, you know, these are the most important elements, which seem pretty obvious, staff training, engagement, facility and equipment upgrades, culturally appropriate recipes, and cost-effective procurement. But we found that the staff training and engagement is really, really key. Because uh, it's hard to have any of the other things without um, telling the staff about what changes you're making and why, engaging them in the process of the change, um, giving them an opportunity to taste the food and maybe alter it a little bit by adding spices or, um, you know, mixing things up a little bit if they can. But giving them um, a stake in the storytelling around it and having them as the frontline staff that are engaging with the students on a day-to-day -day basis be a part of the change and encouraging kids to try things and telling them that they've tried it and it tastes really great. Um, so that's been seen as um, a really, really effective tool. And there are many resources out there, um, like Forward Food, that offer free training to scale up um, the skills um, that, uh, you know, teaching staff um, can have and kind of elevate their part of the process. Uh, in terms of um, recipes, one of the things that we found in our research is the sort of prevalence and excitement around blended burgers. Uh, these um, are typically made with a mixture of um, beef and mushrooms. Erin Timer in San Luis Obispo in California was a really great example of this. She has made uh, friends with a local grass-fed beach beef rancher, and he has been giving her um, opportunity to buy his beef at you know some sort of a discount. And she's been blending it with mushrooms in-house. Luckily, I think she's got a lot of good uh, storage space. Um, and she's serving them to her grade schoolers who are absolutely in love with them. Um, other folks, I'm sure Anne, uh, Chef Anne will talk about this a little bit, but talking about blended um, use of, like, blended bean and chicken or bean and cheese burritos or 
finding ways to blend beef and other ingredients or pork and other ingredients or just some, you know, it could be animal protein with something else so that it's using less of the meat and then potentially providing an opportunity to buy better of that animal um, product. Um, the, the, the idea, though, really is that, you know, creating things that the kids, the students really like, that feel seems culturally appropriate. A school district in Austin, Texas, serves this vegan Frito pie that is a major top seller for them. And, um, and as we mentioned with the example with uh, Lee County, lots of different school districts are using meat alternatives, like Beyond Meat Crumbles, for example, to mix in with tacos and chilies. Um, and or pastas. Um, I'm sure that Chef Anne is going to talk a little bit about the creative ways that she works with um, procurement assets to afford better um, ingredients. But we did find that, you know, when um, food service directors can sort of reimagine their budget by looking at, um, a, like, from a values-based approach, like, okay, I really want to make some new changes. What could I potentially make in-house to reduce my costs? What could I could I go in and bid on some things with other people? Could I potentially make some um, money doing things like breakfast in the classroom, for example, or catering parties at the school for kids or, or what have you, that there are different ways that you can engage um, with the school community and with um, the regulations out there to make sure that you um, are providing you know, the, the kinds of um, climate-friendly foods that you want to uh, begin to incorporate. And leadership was obviously a huge um, key strategy that we uncovered, but it was really the, the breadth of the leadership that um, where everyone really seems to have an opportunity for their voice to be heard in this process. So food service directors being at the front line on a daily basis, but we also heard about a lot of students who were requesting um, you know, that their food service director and or the school board make specific changes and their voices were a really important part of the process. So, for example, um, in Riverside, it was a family that um, was vegan that was asking for them to make sure that they could have vegan op me menu options every single day in the elementary school, but then just be began the process of thinking, um, how could we do, you know, this more? And it wasn't just, it was a parent of eight kids, so it, it really made a difference. Like, she's like, no, we want to participate, but how can you work with us? Um, also, a fourth grader uh, worked with Aaron Primer to bring more vegan options onto the menu, and it was a high schooler in L.A. that initiated a big vegan study, and then we've heard from, you know, folks in, in Lee County that more kids are asking for vegetarian and vegan options, and obviously the trend is out there um, nationally anyway, and so kids are hearing about it, and they want to see these options on their menus. Um, I mentioned parents advocating, um, but, you know, having a, a supportive superintendent was shown to be very um, important, someone who was um, all for maybe getting salad bars in all of the schools. And then industry is um, now kind of getting into the game, too. There are um, more and more sort of pre-made products that are out there that are affordable for schools or more affordable than they used to be. Um, or becoming more affordable all the time um, that are scan labeled that are available. Um, and we have resources in our report that um, share what, what a lot of those um, are. And then obviously I've also mentioned a little bit that lots of nonprofit organizations are out there right now that have funding to help make things easier for school districts. Um, providing free resources and tools or training uh, or guidance on grant making and that sort of thing. Um, and finally, um, we delve into policy in our report in a major way. We found a number of policy actions that can be initiated at the district, state, and federal levels that can make serving um, climate-friendly food um, easier and more cost-effective because we did discover that there were a number of barriers um, as they relate to policy. Um, but it's just a few that I want to highlight here, because Maggie is really going to be talking a lot about policy um, at the end of our webinar today. Um, but it's 
at the district level, um, one that, that we feel is pretty easy to um, or easier to implement would be requesting that a plant-based option be offered daily and have that be embedded inside the district level wellness policy or the um, school level wellness policy that is required that they have. Um, adopting the Meatless Monday or Lean and Green Day um, can be easily implemented. Um, and or engaging with the Good Food Purchasing Program and the Good Food Purchasing Policy, um, which can have a major benefit, again, that kind of multi-tiered benefit. Um, and then also we discovered that um, simple paperwork can be filled out that can make a district or school site be an offer versus serve district for milk, um, and um, which is, um, you know, really helps with the, the reducing milk waste. Um, and I know Maggie's going to talk a lot about reducing or eliminating processed meat. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, um, you know, I hope that now you have a better idea of what climate-friendly food is, uh, what distinguishes it from non-climate-friendly food, and why it's important right now um, to get involved and help be a part of this change. Um, that you can identify and understand the difference that even small recipe swaps can make and understand um, some, of some of the broader strategies. We go into all of this information in much more depth in our report. And there's a link to it right here, but you can easily um, Google Friends of the Earth scaling up climate-friendly school food and either view the entire report in um, its entirety or view each section individually has made it really easy for you to access the information that is most pertinent to your interests. And we have lots and lots of resources in the appendix, including um, a list of all of the nonprofit organizations that are helping um, districts um, and some grant opportunities. So I want to thank you so much for your time again. I look forward to your questions at the end of the presentation. And I want to turn it over to Chef Ann Cooper, who is going to share with us all the great work they're doing at Boulder Valley School District, and then nationally with the Chef Ann Foundation. Thank you very much. OK, thanks, everyone. Well, I'm going to try and be succinct, because uh, I, I'm hoping we can have some questions at the end. So please, everyone, uh, send us some questions so we're just not talking heads talking at you. So I'm the Director of Food Services for Boulder Valley School District, and I'm also the founder of the Chef Ann Foundation. In Boulder Valley, we serve about 14,000 meals a day. Uh, almost all of it's cooked from scratch, which is really helpful when you're trying to do plants forward. We have a long commitment of serving the healthiest possible food. This is our 10th year anniversary. I'm very excited about that. We have a priority on local procurement. We work with local farmers. And uh, about 25% of all the food we procure at this point is procured regionally. We, during the, day, during the typical school lunch, we serve two entrees in elementary school. One is always vegetarian. And we have an end with salad bar. And element, in secondary school is three. So in elementary, we have two entrees, and then the salad bar is an entree as well, and three in middle and high school. Our salad bars are, uh, you can have animal protein and vegetable protein on them, and they're also gluten-free. And as I said, we serve vegetarian items daily, and we have for 10 years. Now, that's not necessarily that they're all plant forward, because a grilled cheese sandwich is vegetarian and 100% animal protein. But there are other things we serve. Uh, the picture in the top left, I think, is uh, tofu bibimbap. Um, and we, so we do serve some plant-forward and some plant-based items. With the Chef Ann Foundation, we have this plant-forward continuum. And there's also an entire webinar on plant-forward, uh, sorry, an entire class uh, for the Chef Ann Foundation School Food Institute that you could take on Plant Forward. In any case, if you look at this continuum, if you go all the way to the left, that's traditional uh, animal-based proteins, MMAs. It can be chicken. It can be pork. It can be turkey. But that's 100%. And then you can move a little so that some of the credible protein is plant-based. So for instance, in our beef nachos, we actually, in our just 
plain beef nachos. We have a percentage of that beef that we took out and put in beans. Now it lowered, it becomes more plant forward that way. We want to put in 0.25 MMAs of plant-based protein in order to do that. You certainly could do more. And then on the continuum, we go to one MMA or 50%. Uh, in uh, a vegan bowl, we have tofu. We also have eggs. And then, if you go all the way all the way to the right, we have chickpea masala, and that's 100 percent vegan, so or, or plant based. So it's a continuum. And I guess what I'd like everyone to understand that's out there that's in school food is this is a lot of baby steps. No one's going to wake up tomorrow and go, oh, we're going to have all you know plant forward or plant based foods. This is not what's going to happen. But through procurement, through scratch cooking, through actually cooking, you can start to make these changes. And not only is it you know, good for the planet, which is what we've been hearing about, but it's good for our health and it's good for the bottom line. I mean, I, we really have to remember that. I mean, if you have, if you look at the continuum and you're all the way to the left and you look at that oven fried chicken, which in our case is hormone antibiotic free, fresh, and local, delivered in reusable containers, but that's actually a pretty pricey dish. If you look at the right, the chickpea masala, you know, the difference is phenomenal. When you're talking about dried chickpeas or commodity food chickpeas, the FDA foods, I mean, it's a tremendously different price. So it's, you know, going plant forward hits all of our goals. And, you know, so one of the things you can do is just you can have a beef and a regular beef nachos or you could have bean and cheese nachos. So you can take baby steps like that. And this is one of the, the things that came out, uh, the findings that came out of the report is over the last seven years, just by offering beef and bean and cheese nachos instead of just the beef option, we reduced our carbon footprint by 800,000 pounds of CO2. So you can make huge changes just by making, you can make a huge difference with little changes. Uh, one of the items we have on the menu this year that can be plant-based is a falafel and hummus flatbread. Uh, if you don't have the creamy cucumbers on it, it's a highly vegan dish. Uh, we have a dish, and this was actually uh, Iron Chef competition winner. So we. We do Iron Chef competitions twice a year in Boulder Valley. Once a year, it's with elementary school kids, and they are so adorable. We just did that with 17 teams. But in the spring, we do it with middle school kids, and the winner always goes on the menu. And this was actually one of the winners because we did an Iron Chef that was, that everything had to be planned forward. So the kids had to come up with plant forward or plant-based menu items, and this was one of them, uh, fully vegan served in our school. This is another really interesting dish that came out of an Iron Chef competition. This is a tomato soup, that's, the base of which is pureed chickpeas. So we always really struggled with this. Many of you might struggle with making sure they're compliant, making sure you have enough protein in the soup. Think, you know, chicken noodle. How do you make sure you have two MMAs of chicken in the right ladle with the stock and the veggies? But with a pureed soup, you can actually know that in every ladleful, you have the right amount of protein. And so this was, again, an Iron Chef winner, tomato bisque, uh, which is uh, vegan, but of course, it does a cheese sandwich. It's just vegetarian. Uh, we have ramen on our menu now. We have chicken ramen, and this year we put on a veggie ramen bowl with some food and edamame. And so a lot of people think, well, Boulder's got all this money. Maybe you all think that Boulder has all this money. Well, Boulder doesn't have much more money than anybody else. Um, but we do a lot to try and work with our students uh, and get them to eat the food. We do 200 events a year with kids to try and get them to eat the food and do marketing and tastings and the Iron Chef competitions. We also do a tremendous amount of fundraising. And we raise every year between $100,000 and $200,000, $250,000 to be able to do this marketing, to be able to work with kids, to be able to help change the palettes of our students. Because at the end of the day, um, if we can't increase ADP, 
while increasing plant forward and plant based options, then we're going to go backwards. We all live and breathe and die on ATP. So we have to make these changes that are good for the planet, that are good for our health, while we're you know, taking care of our bottom line. So that was a lot about the Boulder Valley School District. And I'm just going to talk for a couple more minutes so everyone else has a turn and we can have questions. The Chef Ann Foundation uh, has the lunchbox. We have almost 400 recipes on the lunchbox. And a lot of those recipes are now plant forward. So you can see here our plant forward initiative is called More Plants, Please, More Plants, Please. And that is a chickpea marshmallow recipe. And a big shout out to Brandy Dravovis, who is now the director in Napa. And she helped us with a lot of these recipes. So you can go onto the lunchbox and look at our recipes. Go to More Plants, Please. You can also, at the same time, get marketing materials for elementary and secondary age kids. And these posters are all downloadable from the lunchbox. You can customize them if you want. But these give, you, these give you an idea of the kind of things that you can do to engage kids. And the whole Kids Foundation what was the funding behind this entire initiative. And here's more marketing materials. These are centered on staff in the community. Again, download them, use them, customize them if you want. But we have to be able to make these changes in a financially viable fashion and not just say, oh, Today we want to be vegan or plant-based or plant-forward. I do want to say one other thing. I do call out my food as vegetarian when it is. We started using the term plant-forward when we did the last Iron Chef competition. All of the kids had to come up and talk about plant-forward, what it meant, why it was, you know, why it was something that they were interested in and something they were doing. So. I don't think you have to be shy away from saying food is vegetarian or plant forward. I think that we have to embrace it, we have to educate around it, and we have to really make sure that we're hitting all those things, increasing ADP, using our procurement power to be able to buy hormone and antibiotic-free chicken by serving an equal amount of chickpeas, and we have to educate our kids. Uh, and with that, I am going to pass it along here, and I hope you do have questions that we can answer at the end. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maggie Miola, and I'm a dietitian at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And as a health nonprofit, we help individuals and groups of all kinds learn about and follow a plant-based diet. We have a history of policy initiatives that I want to share with you today, and many of our policy efforts are good for both human and planet health. I'll end with how you can get involved in making policy changes as well. OK, so to start, one of our major focuses for policy change is to add plant-based entrees across institutions, including schools. A plant-based vegan diet is an eating pattern that the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics approves for all stages of life and deems helpful not only for humans, but also the planet. And the Academy is the accrediting body for dietitians in this country. The group cites evidence showing that people who follow a vegetarian diet have lower levels of cholesterol and blood pressure, and lower rates of heart disease and type 2 diabetes than non-vegetarians. The Academy of Pediatrics agrees. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes are low in saturated fat, free of cholesterol, and packed with vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and fiber. You can read the Academy's latest position paper on vegetarian diets to understand more why and how a plant-based diet is helpful. The physiciansCommittee.org, of course, also has an extensive amount of resources on this and education. So with the backing of the Academy and exploding amounts of evidence-based research that has been published on plant-based diets, we feel strongly that it is helpful and necessary for each child to have access to a healthful plant-based meal daily. We also help schools remove processed meats on the menu. And this reasoning is based on the World Health Organization report from 2015 stating that processed meats like hot dogs, pepperoni, bacon, deli meats and sausage are carcinogenic. The authors of the report highlighted 
a meta-analysis that found that each 50-gram portion of processed meat, which is approximately the size of a hot dog or two strips of bacon, eaten daily increases the risk of colorectal cancer by 18%. And colorectal cancer is the second deadliest cancer in the United States and is rising in young people. So schools must take action to reduce that risk so that processed meats are replaced with plant-based, climate-friendly foods. And this menu changes our second initiative related to school lunch policies that we are working on collabor collaboratively across districts and on the state level. Over the years, there have been numerous successes in policy change thanks to our team and passionate members, many of which are plant-based healthcare professionals. The American Medical Association has taken our resolution proposals and passed them, which provides backing to approach policymakers. Processed meat off school menus is beginning on both a micro and macro level. And the Skinner Bill for adding plant-based options in hospitals and prisons in California just passed in September 2018. I'll go into these three successes in detail. So our founder, Dr. Dr. Neil Barnard, worked with the Medical Society of the District of Columbia and the American College of Cardiology to sponsor a resolution at the 2017 AMA House of Delegates meeting. The resolution, which passed, calls for hospitals to provide a variety of healthful food, including plant-based meals and meals low in fat, salt, and added sugars, and to eliminate processed meat. This was an important resolution as it exposes and encourages hospitals to pave the way in offering the healthiest options as they should. Many foods offered in hospitals contribute to obesity, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and cancer, the very same conditions for which many of the hospital patients are seeking treatment. And this call from the AMA is a tool physicians and patients and even school food service professionals can use to work with hospitals and schools to improve the food offered. Earlier this year, the American Medical Association amended an existing resolution with our support. In this amendment, lactose intolerance is noted as common, especially among minorities, and it is recommended that federal law should remove the requirement that students need to have a note in order to receive non-dairy milk. The emphasis of dairy products and the push for meat for protein is worsening the racial disparities in heart disease, prostate cancer, and colon cancer. In each of these, deaths among African Americans are much higher than for whites. And meat and dairy products are key contributors to the epidemic of cardiovascular disease. Until now, federal guidelines have pushed meat for protein and dairy for calcium, and schools have taught the same thing to children. At this meeting, the AMA's House of Delegates called on the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to change their policies to clearly indicate in federal food policies that meat and dairy products are optional. It also called for a change in federal law so that children can request an alternative to cow's milk without having to prove that they have a medical condition that requires it. Cities are also taking a stance. New York City Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams introduced a city resolution in spring 2018 to remove processed meats from all public school lunches. President Adams can personally attest to the benefits of eating plant-based and wants to ensure children in New York City are not being exposed to carcinogenic processed meats in school meals. This resolution is anticipated to have a hearing in the coming months and has led to informative discussions across media outlets. We will be supporting this hearing with in-person testimonies as we find this form of political action to be very effective. Many hearings are open to the public to contribute with oral or written testimony, so let your voice be heard. With great pleasure, I'm happy to say that Santa Barbara Unified School District, as of September 2018, has removed processed meat from their menu. Nancy Weiss, their food service director, is a pioneer in this effort, and her district is the first known to make this change in the U.S. To quote Nancy, whom I admire greatly, she said, there's no room for carcinogens on the lunch line. She has made a change that will inspire other schools to do the same to protect the kids' health and the planet. I had the great pleasure of visiting one of her elementary schools recently to celebrate this change with them. And Nancy has even taken steps to give te testimony on the same topic at the California Board of Education's latest hearing on their proposed state nutrition guidelines. We're happy to work with your school as well to make the same honorable menu changes and be an advocate. The transition is feasible, especially as there are plenty of healthier options that can easily replace processed meat. A great resource we have is our Drop the Hot Dog Toolkit, available on HealthySchoolLunches.org. This toolkit provides the scientific background, menu swaps, resources for the community, and implement implementation strategies. 
uh, please use this free resource and give it any give it to any food service director that you know. And lastly, to expand upon this exciting bill, Senate Bill 1138, which was introduced by Senator Nancy Skinner, and it was sponsored by the Physicians Committee and Social Compassion and Legislation. For Senator Skinner, everyone in the state of California deserves the same access to nutritious food. By ensuring that our hospitals and our prisons provide a plant-based meal option, this bill will help reduce chronic diseases, including diabetes and heart disease. And another quote, Plant-based foods are acceptable, acceptable to most world religions and ethical schools, as well posing fewer problems for people with common food sensitivities like egg and dairy, said Judy Manzuko, founder and president of Social Compassion and Legislation. For these reasons, plant-based options should be provided and promoted in all public institutions, including hospitals and prisons. And so we congratulate California for paving the way. And in future bills like this, we need to include schools. So how can you remove processed needs and have plant-based entrees? Four very effective and popular approaches that I've seen include, one, making a menu change if you're a food service director. You have the power to do that. If you're a parent, you can speak with your food service director um, and really be an advocate for, for seeing changes happen there. You can also start a school food advisory board or get involved in one that is currently running. We have one here locally in D.C. you've been able to attend, and it's led to a lot of really great discussions and, and new options on the menu that kids have been taste testing. So that's another effective way to make change collaboratively. Uh, you can also try to introduce a resolution in your city or a bill with your council member. And lastly, giving testimony for existing proposed policy changes is a really, really effective approach as well. But to break it down onto different levels of policy change a little further, uh, on the district level, you can remove processed meats and add plant-based meals daily, modify school wellness policies, adopt meatless Mondays, and engage with parents and students regularly. On the state level, in addition to making bills or resolutions, you can allocate funds and develop new resources for plant-based nutrition, wellness, and environmental curriculum in order to help students understand the relevance of the menu changes, which is very important. <laughs> And then on the federal level, you can work with the USDA to expand the meat alternate category on the menu to have more plant-based options, which may also require an update to the nutrient requirements for that category so that more plant-based options can qualify. It's interesting to note that the Dietary Guidelines for Americans influence the National School Lunch Program nutrition requirements, and in the 2015 to 2020 edition, it stated that teenage boys in particular should consume less meat and that plant-based proteins are key ingredients to a healthy diet. So as the time to testify draws near for the next five-year period of the dietary guidelines, it's critical to see this recommendation expand and actually spill over into federal programs. So we definitely would love for you to stay in touch. Uh, you can visit our website, physiciansconnect.org. If you specifically want to see our school lunch materials, you can go to healthyschoollunches.org. And then, of course, we're all across social, and you can send me an email directly if you have a question after this. Um, but from here on out, I will let Julian come on back and uh, go forward with some questions to answer what, what questions you have. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Wow, that was an extremely informative uh, series of presentations there. Uh, yeah, thank you all so much for listening. Um, so in just a minute, we'll begin to answer questions. Um, as a reminder, to add questions, simply type them into the question box. Uh, it should be on the right side of your screen. Um, but before we start answering those questions, I want to mention that if you are a RD or DTR uh, and looking to uh, get continuing education credit, um, those who registered for this webinar will receive an email with the certificate. Um, if you are listening to this as a recording and not live, then you will want to email the uh, inbox listed on this slide uh, to ask for the certificate to be sent to you. Um, uh, also, in the email, if you did register, um, should also contain a link to the recording of this webinar, um, which uh, hopefully you can send along to colleagues um, so that others can, um, you know, uh, hear this, this really informative presentation. Um, and then lastly, uh, there will also be a survey evaluation to give us uh, your feedback on today's webinar, uh, what changes you'll make as a result. Uh, and this survey will, will also be emailed up, yeah, excuse me, this survey will also be emailed out after the webinar. Um, 
So now uh, let's get. We let's see. We have a few questions. Um, and if anybody else has a question, please, uh, you'll see the Q and A bar. Uh, just type into the bottom there. Um, so our first question is. Uh, so if, if schools kind of have limited resources or limited budgets, um, how can they make sustainable changes to their menus um, without neg negatively affecting, uh, you know, participation rates or a ADP? Um, I'll open that up. Um, maybe, uh, Anne, you could start, and, and then we'll, we'll go uh, to the others. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to. I think that... For me, it's really based on scratch cooking. When you cook from scratch, you can pick your ingredients. You know, for instance, if you're serving tacos, and, you know, most schools serve tacos, and if you're going to get the taco meat from the USDA, it's mostly beef, it's, uh, it's some uh, additives and some soy, but it's hard to choose to do something else with it. But if you're making your own uh, nachos or tacos, you can take ground beef that can be hormone and antibiotic free, cook it up, add beans to it, bring the cost down. And, and so when you scratch cook, it's giving you that choice, the choice to be able to uh, replace some ingredients with others to balance your menu mix and the cost, overall cost, food cost for your recipes. And it, it really makes a difference. I think the other really important thing is smart procurement. We work really, really hard on procurement. We spend a lot of time making sure we buy the best we can to balance the hormone and antibiotic free beef and chicken with, you know, a lot of vegetable entrees, a lot of vegetable protein entrees. And when you do that, you really can um, bring your costs down while keeping, you know, kid favorites and ADP up, as well as I think it's really important to do kid testing and to be able to do events in the cafeteria to educate kids. Great. Um, Jen, do you have any, anything to add to that? Um, I mean, I just have, I guess I want to say I, I like what um, the Anne's mentioning, you know, just like really engaging the kids, you know, that is just such an important part as, you know, I noted in my presentation about the importance of taste tests. It's just, you know, we've heard from a lot of, um, and this is just not about, it's about sustainability, but it's, we heard from a lot of people that for a lot of kids, from school lunch might be their only meal they get all day long. And so um, for them to try something new is not exactly the risk that they want to take. Um, so, you know, to engage, to engage with the kids as much as possible with new menu items, um, to like, you know, get them to try things um, and introduce them to new flavors or new concepts is such a really important part of the, of the puzzle, I guess, towards sustainability, um, so that they're, um, you know, trying something new and they know it's safe. Uh, the other thing is we heard from um, a lot of folks about the idea of like other student ambassadors to the school food. So for example, I think it's San Diego, I can't remember who, but someone has this thing where they're like, well, don't put yuck in my yum. And so when there are a couple like student school leaders, I guess, when they overhear other kids like dissing on some other kid for like something they, they decided to choose to eat, and, you know, the response you're supposed to give or they, they coach the other students to be like, hey, you can't tell, don't, don't put yuck into his yum. And I just love that, this whole idea of, like, not shaming kids and having, you know, other kids stand up for that. And just kind of creating a culture around um, the school food environment where, you know, if you want to choose something because you want to choose it, you should be able to do that. So, anyway, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I think in the interest of time, uh, Maggie, unless you have something press pressing, I think we just will go on to the next question. Um, so uh, let's see, and I think this might be directed towards uh, Maggie, so this could, this could work, but how could food service directors effectively remove processed meat uh, from the district menu, um, and, and kind of how can parents, staff, students um, be, like, be kind of receptive to those, those changes? Um, I know you went into that uh, in your presentation a little bit, but maybe you can expand a bit. 
Yeah, yeah, great question. So, I mean, the first step is to work with your menu planning team. It may just be one person, but identifying what is actually uh, considered a processed meat on your menu and how frequently it's offered, and then to consider some different options. There are a large variety of recipes that you can use in place of that. It just kind of depends on the interest of your students and your budget, of course. Uh, and then I would also recommend getting a student roundtable together. So getting some kids in there to come taste test some new options and replacements so that they're engaged. And then when you go to actually implement on the menu, uh, making sure that there's announcements and educational opportunities, whether it's uh, visits to the classroom or whatever is actually feasible for your district and your time. Uh, it could be newsletters that are going home. If you're able to actually give people notice that there's changes happening, usually they're more receptive to uh, missing some, some of the things that they're used to seeing on that menu. Uh, so I think allowing people to know what's coming up and uh, if you need, you know, explaining why you're doing that, uh, it makes things more acceptable. And then, of course, replacing it with things that taste great <laughs> and that are healthy and climate friendly is really important. But again, our toolkit is a wonderful resource, and I'm happy to talk through that further with anybody if they're interested. Wonderful. Um, so it looks like we're just one minute over. So thank you all uh, for staying on just a little late. Um, and yeah, big thanks to everyone who joined um, and listened to this webinar, and also to all the school food professionals who are listening. Um, we really appreciate all the, the hard work that you are doing. Um, it's extremely important work. Um, the more I've learned about it, um, I think uh, there's, there's, you know, folks that are in the school food realm aren't getting enough credit, but hopefully they'll start to get more credit uh, moving forward. Um, so yeah, we really appreciate all of your work. Um, and please send this uh, link once you get it to other colleagues to, to spread the word. Um, and uh, yeah, if we, uh, uh, if you do have any additional questions, um, you can email us. Um, and we'd happily, happily get back to you. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much for, for joining.